Even if you don't know much about Norse mythology, you still probably know beings like Thor and Loki, Odin, maybe even Helen Frigg from pop culture. And even though the actual Norse pagan originals are different from their superhero counterparts, today we'll be going over one that doesn't show up in the superhero universe at all. That's right, Freya, the warrior queen of the Valkyries, the most powerful magic sorceress, and the goddess of love, sex, passion, and fertility. Who exactly is she, and how do all these opposing aspects come together into one of the most friendly deities there is to approach? Let's find out. Love and light, death and darkness, I'm Jordan from Grimwire. What's up friends, today we're going to be going over another incredibly interesting deity. As a bit of a heads up, because of the history of the Norse religion, there is very little we do technically know about it. What we do know is that Freya was almost certainly the most popular goddess to worship back then, and is also very popular today. She's said to be a fertility goddess, of abundance and prosperity, of giving and good fortune. She is the love and sex goddess, the sex guru who can unlock the secrets of intimacy, helping you in every realm of relationships. She's the powerful sorceress, the creator of a type of magic called satyr, which is used to raise the dead, see and change the future, and travel the realms of existence. And she is the one who taught this form to Odin himself. And she's also the fierce goddess of war and death, who controls the legions of Valkyries and watches over half the dead in the afterlife. So. That's a pretty impressive resume. In this video, we'll aim for understanding Freya's complex character, starting by looking at the culture she came from, then moving on to her personality and traits, and then finally with some tips to get started working with her in your practice. First, I'd like to give a little personal shout out to my own project, Broken Record. I actually wrote and produced the song you're hearing now specifically for Freya and drew the little picture and little sigil, and it's linked both here and in the description if you're interested. Anyways, let's take it back to the ancient days of Northern Europe. Let's get started. To understand Freya's significance, we first need to look at the culture she came from. If you're pretty well versed in these topics and you just rather get to the meat of Freya, you can skip to this time. Otherwise, let's look at the history of Norse paganism. And actually, you don't even really need that long. You can just summarize it with, we don't really know. The Christians destroyed everything. Video over. But nah, let's see what we can dig up. Let's go back in time to a time we all know and love, to the Vikings, over 1,000 years ago to the year 800 AD. Okay, now let's double that and we find ourselves in the year 400 BC. This is the start of the Scandinavian Iron Age, considered to be when the most ancient of the Germanic religions started one branch of which grew into what we now know as the Norse culture. The teachings in religion at this time were spread almost entirely orally and heavily based on sacrifice and ritual. Thus, there was no central text, and nearly everybody practiced differently. This was only intensified when the year 800 finally did hit, and the Vikings started colonializing, bringing their beliefs with them, spreading them out, and growing more diverse in the process. However, 200 years later, about the year 1000, the Christians started getting their fingers in the mix, and another 200 years later, by the time 1200 hit, Christianity had their grip on Northern Europe for a while, trying their best to stomp out paganism. This resulted in nearly all information, which was only ever really passed on orally, eventually being wiped out. At this time, however, two of our oldest and most important sources for Norse belief and practice, the Poetic and Prose Eddas, were written. Although, they were written by the Christians, not by the actual practitioner, so it's more tales about the gods than how to worship them. Some of the stories, though, were shown to have gone back orally to at least the year 900. From here, up until the 1900s, the gods and goddesses largely existed as folk tales. Then, recreations of the ancient religion started springing up in various forms, which brings us to today. So, all of those concepts are really relevant to Freya, because being a goddess of love, sex, magic, and death, she was hit pretty hard by the Christianity nerf. And that's an idea I'll keep coming back to throughout the whole video. And now that we understand that the Christians influenced the stories that were passed on, let's take a little look at the history of actual Norse mythology. Just to say it again, we can't really guarantee you what of the following was believed by pre-Christian Norse people, and this is pieced together by me from several different variations of what we do have. At the start of time, there was a void, absent of anything and everything. Then, to the south of that, a great fire caught and started to rage, infinitely bright and hot. Immediately, its exact opposite, cold and dark to the north, manifested. It was a frozen wasteland. 
Slowly the ice melted, and from that, the first creature Ymir, the first of the first race of beings, the giants emerged. Also, there is a giant cow who licked salt from the ice, and Ymir drank its milk. Ymir grew, and the cow licked the ice until a being named Beery, the grandfather of Odin, emerged. Odin and his siblings, the first gods, grew upset at Ymir's cruelty and overthrew him. From his corpse, the earth was created, the oceans came from his blood, the land from his flesh, and his bones created the mountains, his skull the sky. Different species, like elves and dwarves, came from the maggots on his rotting corpse. Odin gathered fire from the fireland and created the sun and moon. The ice started to melt and trees started to grow. Yggdrasil, the greatest tree ever, stretched from the bottom of creation to the top. Odin named this place Midgard. It's where we live. He then created humanity from tree trunks and called them Ask and Emble. Odin gave them life, his one brother Vili gave them intelligence, and the other Ve gave them the senses. Thus Odin is called the Allfather. Some of Ymir's siblings were kind of ticked about the whole you killed our brother thing and cursed humanity to never be as powerful as the gods and to have to face death. Thus, death and suffering were introduced into the world. They did this with a spell on Yggdrasil, essentially limiting every human's life by carving into its trunk, and that's why it's called the Tree of Life. Then, the brothers created a fancy little realm called Asgard, separated from the others, only connected by the Bifrost Bridge. The strategic position gave the gods their reign. Now all of these friends, Odin, Frigg, Thor, Loki, and the bunch, are the group of gods known as the Aesir. The other group of gods, which are much less popular and written about, are called the Vanir. As far as I can find, the only origin story we have is, they came from a faraway place. There's some wars between the Aesir and the Vanir, and it's stated they have equal power, but we just don't know much about the Vanir. Anyways, really the most important Vanir, Freya and Freyr, get traded to the Aesir as hostages anyway. So Freya isn't quite primordial, she's not a giant, but she is one of the most, if not the most, powerful Vanir, which certainly stands for something. She's also frequently compared to be about the same power level as Odin. She gets her pick of the dead first, and she taught him magic. But it's never quite clear who would win in a fight. Usually I like to look at the history before drawing any conclusions, but in this case the stories we have about Freya are just so odd that I think it's going to be best to take an overview of her before trying to piece together those parts. Freya means lady, as an honorific, like an even more formal version of Mrs and might not reflect the deity's original name. It's thought to be assigned to her nobility, rank, and power. You can kind of think of it as if there was a deity that we just walked around calling Queen. Okay, I can see it. Her brother is Freyr, another fertility deity who served two main purposes. A, he was a symbol for the perfect manifestation of a leader. He was kind and just, but strong, creative, and caused growth. He also, B, was kind of the fertility deity of the land and animals. This is important for reasons I'll cover later, but for the most part, Freyr tends to be the go-to deity in general more than Freya. She had no notable canonical husband, and what I mean by that is early on it was implied she was married to her brother, but then she was married to a god named Odor. And even though there's a bit of a mystery hidden somewhere in there, which we'll get into a little later also, on the surface, he's just not too popular or developed to really take a dive into him himself. Freya is the only veneer goddess with an actual name. It's not like we know many more veneer gods, but we at least have her brother and dad, Njord. She was hands down one of the most popular Norse goddesses. In fact, even though I said Norse paganism was wiped out by about 1200, we do have evidence of her cults lasting another two to 300 years after the fact. And even though there is a bunch of argument back and forth, Friday is typically said to come from the term Freya's day. If you've ever heard the story of how in ancient times, Friday the 13th was actually Freya's or some other goddess's divine day or whatever, until Christianity turned it into a bad luck day to spider, yeah, sorry, but that's not really true. Christianity did a lot, don't get me wrong, but we simply don't know where the myth of Friday the 13th being bad luck came from. But we know it was before the Christians, and we certainly have no evidence of Friday the 13th ever being a holiday or anything similar to any ancient group. But I certainly don't think that doesn't mean you can't take Friday the 13th and set it aside for Freya or any other divine goddesses. But I do always call out misinformation when I see it. You don't need to pretend your idea is ancient in order for it to have merit. Anyways, let's look at a few of her domains. First, it's important to note that Norse deities were more like ancestors or heroes rather than kind of the natural chaotic forces of the Greeks. Thus, Norse deities don't have hard domains like the Greeks and some other pantheons do. Instead, this is more of a list of parts of life where they were deemed relevant. First up, we have one of her more quoted qualities, and that's as the goddess of fertility and prosperity. 
Although it seems to be the thing that's most often said, her fertility aspects, in the realm of pregnancy at least, are really one of her qualities that I have a trouble tracing a root for, and others besides me have noticed that as well. Essentially, the way I've come to think about it is that Freya is a powerful feminine sorceress of noble sand, who can change fate and grant wishes. Besides that, the veneer gods in general are gods that are associated with fertility in nature. So I think it might be more fair to say that, in the Norse pantheon, Freya is one of two options if you are looking to get pregnant, but I wouldn't say it's her first or even fourth domain that stands out specifically. I've linked an article in the sources that specifically talk about Freya's fertility potency from a modern witchcraft point of view. Instead, as that article points out, Freya is more overwhelmingly a goddess of sex and power, fertility in a prosperity and opportunity sense of fine things and blessings. But as the author tells a personal story, there's certainly some more of the classical fertility connections. So instead, let's look at that at Freya as the goddess of love, passion, sex, and attraction. Canonically, she was said to be the most beautiful of all the gods, and was frequently seen using her powers of flirtation to win people over. In one myth, Loki accused her of having slept with all the gods, to which Freya herself didn't really seem to mind. I just imagine she kind of winked. You'll frequently hear that Freya is similar to Aphrodite, or Venus, which I don't think is necessarily wrong, but by default, I do tend to avoid grouping goddesses together like that. To say that Freya is Venus, or is Aphrodite, kind of ignores the finer aspects of all of them. That is fine for some applications, such as when you're just learning, or for archetype work, but I think it's just a little rude to be like, yeah, you're a divine goddess vaguely related to love, and then you're the same. And this pretty much goes for all deities. Comparing Zeus to Odin is like, comparing Zeus to Odin, I'm not really sure how much different you can get. Anyways, I don't want to assign the differences myself, but I will talk a little bit about how I do see them. If we think of Venus as kind of the divine feminine passion, and as Mars as the divine masculine passion, I think Freya actually falls somewhere in the middle or as a combination of the two of them, like it breaks those concepts of gender entirely. I think Freya certainly has aspects of Aphrodite, but Aphrodite by nature tends to be the more fickle, chaotic side of love. And I don't want to paint an unfair picture. In practice, Aphrodite and Venus are way more complex than that. I'm just talking a little bit more in general here. Instead, Freya was the goddess of prostitution, but not in a modern sense, in more a sex-positive sense, as a sexual sorceress and a master of the heart and seduction, a kind of sex and relationship guru. He would seek for guidance and understanding of the mysteries of love and sex. Not only that, but it included sex magic, using the power of an orgasm to do spell work, bringing us to magic. Sex and orgasms were, are, seen as very powerful, and could be used for divination or other powerful magic. Freya was seen as the creator and most powerful vulva of Seder, in which one hypes themselves up into a trance and sends out their energy to either read or reweave the strings of fate themselves. Other gods came to her for advice and fate workings. She even taught it to several gods including Odin. She was also known to be one of the most powerful shapeshifters. But that's not all, because we still have one more key part, and that's as goddess of war and the afterlife. Freya was noted as Queen of the Valkyries and, depending on definitions, can be identified as one herself. She was said to take half of those who died in battle to Folkvanger, not just warriors, but also those who died a sacrificial death. So she was ruler of the Valkyries, and was no doubt a powerful badass. But as far as I can find and tell, she wasn't quite a goddess of war, like how Athena or Ares were prayed for literal war and conflicts, or a goddess of the afterlife, quite like how Hades was said to watch over and protect those who die. I also can't find any hard evidence of her being a psychopomp, or guide of the dead souls, like Hecate. Instead, her Valkyries did that job. In my interpretation, she is just, in general, a really strong, powerful figure who kind of technically owns part of the afterlife real estate and takes responsibility for its general management which is badass and motherly, but still a little different from the vibe I feel is presented by some of the more artistic interpretations. As far as I can find in myth, there's not much interaction of her and souls, humans, or any sort of direct influence in mortal affairs, at least like Thor seems to directly protect and intervene in human lives. In fact, now's a good time to go over the stories and myths that do feature her. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, despite Frey's popularity and due to the oral nature of these traditions and how Christianity really hated her, we just don't have many good myths with her in action like with Thor and Loki. Most of what we do get in the poetic and prose edits is simply one of two things. The first is just kind of exposition dropping all the other info I'm telling you, 
Like it just straight up says, whenever Freya rides into battle, she gets half the slain and the other half to Odin, with not much other explanation. In fact, she does have two kids, but they're mentioned in this way. It literally just says she has them and lists their names. Or, in two of the myths featuring her, she's a supporting character who somebody else just wants to marry. However, I wouldn't lead you on like this if there wasn't at least one or two good stories to bring up. On to story number one. The most interesting myth I can tell is actually only even connected to Freya because of the huge overlap between the main character, named Gullivag, who some scholars think is Freya, as she's too powerful and there couldn't be many other options to choose from. The story starts with a few fellas from the Aesir walking down the road, and all of a sudden a sorceress appears. She tells them she has the ability to change fate, which is supposed to be pretty flippin' difficult. She proves herself, and they welcome her back to Asgard. She helps them with some serious stuff, but they begin to fight over who would get to use her to do this or that petty little thing. Then fighting gets pretty serious, and they accuse her of trying to turn them against each other and tie her up. They try to kill her, burning her alive three times, but she survives each, and they let her go, as they weren't strong enough to kill her, and what else are you gonna do? Once she was released, she revealed herself as supposedly Freya. This story stands out for a few key reasons. One, it shows the Aesir are unable to kill a Vanir, showing they are indeed more equal. And two, this is the event that many agree started the Asir Vanir war, but like everything else, it's ultimately unknown what did. In the next story, Freya's servant gets curious about his ancestry because he doesn't know. Remember the importance of ancestry in Norse belief. Not knowing your ancestry is like not knowing who you are. Essentially, they go on an adventure, and with the power of flirting and death threats, she gets the information for her servant that he wants. This shows her caring side, I guess, at least for her worshippers at least. And finally, story number three. The third myth I can find where Freya is a main character came almost a full 300 years after these past two stories. This story is kind of odd all throughout and forewarning, as Christian influence is painfully obvious. It actually features Freya in a relationship with a married Odin. She was out one day on a stroll and came across four dwarves smithing a golden necklace. She struck a deal where she'd sleep with them in exchange for the necklace. She gets the necklace and Loki finds out and tattles on her to Odin, who then tasks Loki in return with stealing it from her. It took even all of his might to be able to sneak past her defenses, but he does end up getting it. Odin gets all weird and jealous and mad and makes an even weirder deal. That she would never get the necklace back unless she made two giant armies battle each other for all of time, reviving the dead as they fell. That is, until a lovely handsome Christian man goes in and smites them to make them stay dead. No, I'm not making that part up. That's how the story goes. But hey, what a coincidence. That leads us right into Christians and the Friggin' Mystery. So I've mentioned a few times how Christianity was pretty unfair to her, so let's take a quick second to dive into that, and it gives us a few more clues about her full history and background. Of course, we don't really know, but here's a few thoughts about where the trouble lied. Ultimately, it comes down to the fact that Freya just didn't connect too well to the Virgin Mary. Christianity was taking over Europe, and their go-to move was to rewrite and connect deities with Christian figures. Odin and Baldur connected pretty well to God and Jesus, and Freya, due to her popularity, was the obvious choice for the Virgin Mary. However, Due to her associations with sex, magic, and the afterlife, it seemed a little contradictory to what the Virgin Mary stood for. Along with the fact that Christianity was sexist and wiped out most mention of goddesses in general, Freya got hit especially hard. A little icing on the cake is that her connection to both the good souls in the afterlife and the evil spooky sex magic, through the Christian worldview at least, made it seem like she had reign over heaven and hell and there was no way they were going to let her have that much power. So the theory goes that Freya, the goddess we've covered this whole time, and Frigg, Odin's canonical wife and queen of the gods, goddess of the home, marriage, childbirth, women, and the earth, were originally the same goddess, who shared more of the same aspects. Freya was split off during the Christian invasion to keep Frigg pure enough to relate to the Virgin Mary. Before I get into the proof for this theory, I just want to point out that the idea that Freya and Frigg may have originally been the same deity does not mean they are currently interchangeable. We don't know how deities work. All I can say is that to many, many today and back then, Freya and Frigg are in practice independent deities who may have shared in history a common origin. They are not the same deity now. 
None of this makes either more real or more valid than any other date. Anyways, on to Freya vs. Frigg. The thing is, we have some historical records of most gods before the Eddas, and going back to the Iron Age. Either gods with the similar names in surrounding areas, or archaeological evidence like this. So the odd thing with Freya, we don't really see her in any other country outside Scandinavia, unlike Frigg, who is found Friggin everywhere. The earliest differentiation we know for sure is traced to the 900s, a pretty important year. Guess is that Frigg was the name of the original deity, and all the bad parts got shoved under the title Freya, until over time, they just evolved and split. Further evidence is that Freya is married to Odor, and literally, the only thing we know about him is that he travels and wanders a lot and Freya gets sad. Meanwhile, Frigg is married to Odin, who travels and wanders a lot. But we don't know this for sure. Some people do convincingly argue it's all a huge coincidence. Either way, the recurring theme is that our sources for Freya aren't the best, the stories aren't the best, but without a doubt, she is alive and strong today. It's important to remember that deities as a concept are flipping weird in and of themselves, and ultimately it doesn't matter the name or form or anything else. The only thing that matters is the connection, the experience, and your interpretation. Freya might be Frigg, might be Aphrodite, might be something. Who knows? You might not worship Freya in the same way, or some things might not feel the same to you, or the Norse revival aesthetic may not be right for you. The stories are weird, but as with all deities, if you feel a pool, you want to know more about Freya herself, give them a shout out and see if you feel anything back. Meditate and contemplate on her symbols, stories, and vibe, set up a little space or altar, and maybe leave some offerings. Literally, whatever feels right. Starting with her symbols, most notably, she has a lot of animal ones, including cats, which pulls her chariot across the sky, hawks, which she shapeshifts into, cows, and boars. She also has a big connection to birch trees, and she's said to carry a sword. As far as her colors, you can use red for her passion aspects, gold for her nobility and prosperity aspects, you can also use green for fertility, and black or purple for the magical aspects. As far as the elements go, she has a pretty strong connection to all the elements, although fire certainly seems to stand out, and she tends to be the less watery of the love goddesses. As far as offerings go, you're going to want to go with things that have meaning, and that you put time and energy into, rather than worrying about what it is. Music, poetry, and other creative endeavors towards her are very well received, and it's why I wrote the song for her. You can also do jewels, crystals, flowers, or other personal gifts. Historically, we have records of two things that were done. The first is giving fruits, veggies, or drinks as an offering, and the second is building an altar of stones called a horger. It's just like a little place to pile stones and pray as opposed to a temple that has a roof. And of course, you can do anything related to magic, devote rituals or meditations to connect with her. Speaking of, the types of magic that I would personally recommend to connect with Freya are divination in general. Runes are an obvious first choice, but there's a little bit of historical nuance. I don't want to derail too much here, but runes didn't have the same historical purpose that they do today. That doesn't mean you shouldn't use modern runes that connect with Freya, though. But if tarot, tea, or candle readings are more your thing, those all go along with her vibe pretty well, too. Next, love magic which she's pretty great for. She helps with confidence and passion, and is pretty good at granting blessings. I don't typically recommend make this person fall in love with me spells, but there are a few spells you may consider. The first being help bring the right person into my life, or maybe help bring out my own passion and desire, or even help reignite the passion in this old relationship. Next is sex magic. Surprisingly different from what I just called love magic, sex magic is more about transferring sexual energy into power. While love magic is about getting in touch with your inner love blob and using that as fuel to fulfill those desires, sex magic is about using your natural sex energy to power any desires you have. Really, really simplified, just think about your intentions as you climax and that's sex magic. And as if that didn't throw enough people off, I feel blood magic often gets a really serious vibe about it. Some people say that blood magic is the only type that can't be undone, which if that's your thing, go for it. But a lot of traditions treat it sincerely, without such cryptic warnings behind it. And further, there are other things called blood magic, but here I'm just talking about using your own blood as a spell ingredient. In its most innocent form, if you do cut or scrape yourself, dab a little blood on a clean napkin, draw a sigil on it, say a prayer, and burn it. That's it. I won't give any advice on how to, in fact I'll even say on camera that you shouldn't intentionally cut yourself, but many traditions do have techniques that they claim is safe. 
I'm just not dealing with the liability because there are physical things that you might not think about that could go wrong. Either way, blood magic is usually done to symbolize a personal connection and to show your sincerity. If you're not willing to literally bleed over something, how bad do you even truly want it? I personally don't subscribe to any dire warnings, but I do believe the practice should be treated with respect. Anyways, as I've mentioned through the video, there's also Seder. Unfortunately, diving too deep into Seder is a bit beyond the scope of this video, as there's many, many aspects, and we'll never have enough information to accurately recreate it. But there are a whole bunch of ideas out there that should really get your imagination going. I link to a few in the description. So, how does Freya typically manifest in people's practices today? Most notably, as a guru of female, romantic, or sexual empowerment, including things like sexuality and confidence, self-sufficiency, loving yourself, and trusting your heart and emotions. And obviously, this doesn't just apply to women. All genders can benefit from this energy and these lessons. She also takes on a high priestess role as a spirit guide and source of wisdom, information, power, and even blessings. She's an intensely protective deity, and she's appreciative and giving and kind and extremely approachable given some of the deep topics she covers. In general, she's a very popular matron deity, great for beginners and the experienced, for those who want to lean towards a balance of light and dark, who want to get lost in passion, yet be able to focus when they need to. She is, however, a very honor and heart-driven deity, and has a bit of a Saturnian side. This article does a pretty decent job covering some of these aspects in her, though the tone and writing is a little intense in and of itself. Essentially, she has the ability to bless big, but she takes big too. Everything you're willing to handle, and then some. You must be willing to sacrifice, to grow, and to learn hard and fast. She will test you and challenge you, but it will be for your benefit, and you will end up getting what you want and need. One of the reasons Freya sticks out to me is that she's a big, powerful, intense energy that compares the depth and darkness of deities like Lilith and Hecate, yet still has the friendliness and warmth of a deity like Artemis for beginners. Signs she's calling out to you are going to line up a lot with other deities of passion and magic, to the point where it might be hard to tell which one it is. Those include visions in your imagination, or dreams of a friend or lover that isn't quite a friend or lover, a very strong desire to worship, to honor, to submit, a feeling of divinity that feels a little different, yet the desire to remain free and independent and powerful, to do what is necessary to thrive. And if you feel her energy, you feel the desire to connect with the name and form of Freya. So we have a powerful goddess of passion and magic who even taught the All-Father Odin, who underwent an attempted assassination by Christianity, but managed to stay alive through folklore the entire time, and to make an incredibly influential and much needed comeback in today's modern age. And after all of this, all I can think is, damn, that one company really did Freya dirty by not including her. But what would you really expect? They'd probably screw up a complex deity like this anyway. Be sure to share any experiences that you have of Freya with me and others down in the comments below. And let me know which deity you'd like to see covered next. I have a list started and keeping track of which one's the most recommended. If you really like this video, please be sure to give it a like. And if you want to learn more about all paths, religions, and pantheons, please be sure to hit that subscribe button. Either way, thank you for all your love and support. And thanks for watching, friends. I'll see you around.